Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Alicia Pettis. Thank you for joining us today. I'm with Northern Plains Resource Council. Uh, hope you can hear us OK. Please um, give us feedback on the chat um, if you're having any trouble hearing. Uh, today's webinar is called Financing Energy Efficiency at Rural Electric Co-ops. And this webinar is part of a special presentation as part of the Northern Plains Annual Meeting uh, which is going on in Billings here today and tomorrow. So we're excited to bring you this presentation from Tammy Agar of EE Utility and David Bach from Flathead Electric Cooperative. Because one of the goals of Northern Plains Resource Council is to remove any artificial barriers that might keep people from accessing renewable energy and energy efficiency. We see financing or prohibitive upfront costs as one of those barriers. Renewable energy and energy efficiency measures often pay for themselves over time, but how can we help people afford that upfront cost? Over the past, past few years, we've also been focused on empowering members of Montana's rural electric cooperatives to work with you all, their democ democratically elected boards and local management to create more clean energy opportunities in rural Montana. So with that in mind, we're thrilled to have Tammy Agar here from Arkansas to share about her work bringing energy efficiency financing programs to rural electric cooperatives. So I'm going to introduce Tammy briefly before turning it over to her. Tammy Agard is the co-founder and CEO of EE Utility, a B or benefit corporation, an energy efficiency program operator located in Little Rock, Little Rock Arkansas, that specializes in operating on-bill energy efficiency programs in the electric cooperative sector. Tammy is grateful to work alongside forward-thinking co-ops and other energy efficiency stakeholders across the country who share the desire to bring energy efficiency opportunities to all. Tammy considers herself a social entrepreneur who is deeply rewarded by combining her skills for business with her sincere desire to help the energy efficiency industry create, embrace, and operate all-inclusive energy efficiency program models at scale. Founded in 2014, E-Utility currently operates the HELP and HELP Pay As You Save programs, or PAYS programs in Arkansas, and the Upgrade to Save program in North Carolina. So thank you for joining us, Tammy. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that wonderful welcome. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you in advance to all of you on the phone who have joined us this morning to uh, hear some stories about what we're doing in North Carolina and Arkansas that hopefully you find of value. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right on in and get started here, if my control works. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to give you guys a, a, a little bit of a uh, insight into the two types of programs that our firm operates, one being an on-bill loan program, which of course implies debt to the participant, uh, and the other is tariff on-bill and this one alternately does not require debt. Um, we've had a lot of experience with both, and so I'm going to kind of walk everyone who's, who's on this webinar through what our uh, experience has been with operating both, and the uh, really the benefits of, of one over the other, I think, will be pretty stark. So to start off with, I'm going to talk about the Help versus Help Pays program. Both of these programs are simultaneously being operated by utility in Arkansas. HELP is the loan-based program and HELP pays is the tariff on bill program. There are currently six cooperatives in Arkansas who operate the, we operate their loan program for, and that is how we started in Arkansas. Um, and there are two co-ops in Arkansas that are operating the HELP pays program. We do anticipate the other co-ops in Arkansas who are still up, we are still operating a loan program for to switch over to the tariff program in the next year. And the reason why we're going to get in, into as I as I go through this uh, PowerPoint. So a little bit of information about the, um, the areas we serve. Of course, I'm sure the fact that 93% of persistent poverty counties overlap with rural electric cooperative ser service territories is not news to the folks on this call. Um, but 
In particular, with regard to Arkansas, the household median income in the areas that we are providing the tariff program is $29,000 compared to where I'm from in the state or where I live in the state where it's, uh, it's $52,000. Um, this particular case study is for Washita Electric Cooperative who has 8,500 meters, 6,500 of which are residential. And the housing stock is between 50 and 75 years old, with probably a third of the housing stock uh, being mobile homes. So to get you all warmed up on the idea of the tariff, I'm going to show you a brand new video that not a lot of folks have seen yet, but it'll get its, its uh, debut on this. Can you click on that to make that? There we go. There we go. So hope you guys enjoy this. Or we'll come back to it. <laughs> Okay, that's all right. We'll cut. That's okay. We'll come. We'll come back to it if we can. Um, well, there, there. That was a big dud. So there we go. <laughs> um, all right. Well, hopefully we can get that big so you guys can see it. Uh, apologize for that, but I'll just move right along then. So let's look at a side by side uh, the basic differences, the big picture differences between the loan program and the tariff program operated by our firm in Arkansas. Um, as you can see on the left. Uh, that's where we have the loan program, and the right is where we have the tariff. So just kind of go in order. Um, first of all, with the tariff, residential participants are eligible as well as the loan program, so no difference there. However, a big difference with the tariff program is renters are eligible. Um, there is no credit score check and no debt to income ratios in Arkansas for most of the co ops, though some of them that offer the loan program do require credit checks. Um, I can say in North Carolina, where we're operating, if it's a loan program, in most other places, if it's a loan program, it does require credit check, and if it's a tariff program, it doesn't. So, um, there is no upfront participant cost in, in either. Um, the estimated savings must exceed the cost recovery charges by 20%. That is of great value to a tariff based program. A lot of the reason why a lot of folks are able to say yes is because not only is it, you know, a debt neutral, um, it's not just debt neutral, it's actually, you know, an investment that gives them a return on their investment. And that is 20% of the energy savings that they experience if their home stays in their pocket, essentially. So it's a financial motivator and a bit of a relief to those who are financially stressed. Uh, in the loan program, the participant signs a loan or a promissory note for debt obligation. Of course, that's not the case in the tariff. Again, it's not a debt. It's considered an investment from the utility that's made on the member side of the meter. So that means it's a cost recovered by the utility, but again, not personally you know, guaranteed by the, by the participant. Uh, and that kind of goes into what I did, that, that next line right there, the participant accepts an opt-in tariff, utility tariff, tied to the meter, which does mean that in the event of default, uh, it, they can be disconnected for failure to pay, just like their utility bill. Um, that said, of course, certain, during certain times of year, they, they can't do that just like any other uh, you know, regular utility cost. So the recovery is through a fixed charge on the utility bill, and during the question and answer period, we can get a little more detail about how that works, but roughly, generally speaking, um, we back into the term not to exceed typically 10 years, sometimes as much as 12, depending on the circumstances, but we back into the term based on the savings that are there in order to produce that 20% um, es essentially uh, cash flow positive result for the participant. Um, any program that utility operates requires 100% on-site QC inspection for payment authorization. Um, and a pretty neat feature, I've got to say, that a lot of the co-ops we work with absolutely love about this particular component is that we essentially train co-op staff who are already out in the field, not new hires. There's no reason to hire one new person to do this program from a co-op's perspective. 
Um, but we train them to actually go out to the member's home and witness a new blower door and a new duct plaster test while the contractor uh, is still at the home before they've actually left. Uh, not unlike you'd call for an inspection, for example, from an electrical, you know, some state inspector to come show up and, and take a look at the work. Um, that's exactly what we do. The, the, uh, the co-op person, usually a, uh, a lineman, you know, that's already out in the field working or a woman, um, they simply are dispatched over to the member's home. They get to show up sort of wearing a Superman costume because they have helped bring this member some much needed relief, comfort, improve their health, yada, yada, um, with all the things that, that have just been installed in the member's home. So uh, they have a chance to witness a new blower door duct blaster test, like I said, um, make sure all the tasks on the member's scope of work were completed. Um, they communicate all to that to our firm digitally with proof of all that. And based on that evidence, we authorize payment to the co-op. Um, and that actually triggers the member to start paying that tariff charge back on their bill 45 days later. So 100% QC, um, and the only cost really to that for anyone is the soft costs incurred by the co-op. Um, and again, it's with, with staff that are already out in the field, so it's typically not, you know, not, not a big burden. Um, next, um, the participant, of course, with the uh, terms of the tariff is accepting the fact that they can disconnect, be disconnected for non-payment. However, again, I'll just remind everybody that uh, they are experiencing a cash flow savings of 20% in their pocket of the actual savings. So in other words, if there was $100 a month energy savings that was um, expected to occur, $80 would be used to pay the co-op back and $20 would stay in the member's pocket. pocket. Thus, it's a cash flow positive experience. Um, unlike the uh, loan program, uh, because there, this is a tariff charge and it's essentially with the, with the utility and utility that this, um, these improvements will last for the term of the tariff. We actually can hold the contractor responsible if a failure exists in the home during the tariff payback period. So um, that's a that's a great a great tool to have in the event we have a contractor that has has you know not provided the service that the co-op and therefore the member is paying back. Um, so we can call upon that contractor to come back out and, and deal with that situation. In fact, our requirement in the PACE tariff is that we must, as a utility, we must do that process. In the event that a contractor was no longer working, by the way, or decided, I don't want to fix this, not only would we stop their contract, but utility actually has to step in and pay that fee to, to get the member back into the situation they should be, where they're getting the savings they should have. So a lot of consumer protection pieces built into the PACE system, one of the reasons I really like this, this model. Um, so what happens if someone moves or in the, in the circumstance like a renter, uh, a, a renter moves out, another tenant moves in? Uh, it's quite simple. It's, it's, the tariff is tied to the meter, so it just goes to the next person. Um, there is a, a uh, disclosure form that the member signs when they uh, sign up for the program, and they are saying that they will disclose to the next homeowner, or the landlord is signing that they will disclose to the next tenant that there is a tariff charge at that location, as well as what the improvements are at that location, um, and as a result, what the utility bill has been at that location. So it's really transparent. Um, and then, of course, when the member, the new member, homeowner or, or renter, goes to the co-op to sign up for services, they are signing up that they understand there's a tariff charge on that and that they essentially are inheriting that tariff charge, of course, along with the improvements of that location. Um, in the event, by the way, that a, a in, the, in the case of a landlord situation or a home, in the case the power is turned off um, because the property is vacant, whether again it's a home cell or a, or a rental property, the tariff charge simply stops along with the electric charge and um, it, can, it can stop for up to two years before it essentially becomes uh, you know a question of and that's really more 
what's happened to the integrity of those installs and the property has been sitting vacant for that period of time. So um, it essentially sits there and then starts again when the electric when the power shut back on. Um, in Arkansas, our state energy office provides a loss reserve um, for both the loan program and the tariff program. I'm happy to report, and the general managers on the on the call should be um, interested to hear this. Uh, we have had zero defaults to date. Uh, in either program, and as a matter of fact, nationally, the default rate, um, particularly in the tariff program, is less than 0.025%, which I'm sure you all realize is actually less than the typical uh, disconnect chart. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's quite a quite a compelling. Um, Proof really that we're mitigating a perception of risk when we have a loss reserve, but we're not really mitigating risk. We don't we really have no evidence of, of a problem with this. In fact, if anything, it tends to put members in a better position financially. So when we switched um, with the with a couple co-ops from the loan program to the tariff program, here's the really exciting news that that uh, we experienced. First of all, uh, we did, that is not an not overstatement, we experienced explosive growth, absolutely explosive growth. Uh, first of all, of course, nobody had to qualify for a loan. Um, the the quote-unquote qualification process simply was and remains, does your home or mobile home or apartment need an energy efficiency intervention, and if so, is it structurally sound to last for the term of the tariff? If the answer is yes, then the home qualifies to receive the upgrade. So there's no debt to income check, there's no obligation, there's no any of that. Um, and that's a huge, a huge barrier to an awful lot of folks being able to get, get some assistance with those high bills. Um, so it, it showed it in, in, in it was three times more than the total loan portfolio over a three-year period. In just the first uh, 10 months of the program, um, in this particular Arkansas, Southern Arkansas Delta region, the co-op invested $1.8 million in the first 10 months of switching over to the tariff into their own community. Um, there was one multifamily housing um, facility in all of the Washtenaw Electric Service Territory and 100% of that facility was upgraded, which is 85 units. Um, I'm happy to say, by the way, uh, this is, I should mention this, this was not a, a federally designated low-income housing facility. Um, however, the highest rental was 300, is $350 a month. Um, and the, the average square footage of those units was 650 square feet. So just giving you that information should say these were not government are not government subsidized, but I don't think anybody can argue that that's not essentially a low income housing facility. Um, so 100% of that multifamily property was upgraded without one dollar of government subsidies, and the average savings per tenant is over fifteen dollars a month. So um, I should mention that, although I don't expect there's much in the way of multifamily properties in Montana, I'm sure, I'm sure there are in some areas, but the big story there is, this is one of the facts that have given the PACE tariff such tremendous recogni recognition from the Department of Energy, um, and, and certainly those that are interested in providing inclusive solutions uh, for lower income folks. Um, in that 10 months, 173 HVAC units were installed, um, and I'm just going to skip along because I, I, I'm going to point out the, the advantage of that to the cooperative here in a second. Um, 88 participants um, in those first 10 months were multifamily or single-family renters. Uh, early estimates, which at that point in time were about four months old, 
Um, this, this slide is a little bit old. I can give you some updates during the Q&A session if you want to talk about this. But, but um, Washtenaw Electric experienced an average of 2 kW reduction in peak demand, which for that cooperative uh, means somewhere between $250 and $300 a year in avoided costs, which the average tariff term uh, for those is 10 years. So without rate increases, that's avoided cost to the co-op of $2,500 to $3,000 per participant in peak demand. So if you can, you know, do the math real quickly, you, you have a, I mean, you have 100 members participating a year. That's a pretty big number pretty quick over the life of the tariff. And for each co-op, by the way, that, or any uni or IOU, whatever, that, that has an interest in, in exploring the tariff, pays tariff before they agree to uh, jump on board, just doing their due diligence, we can model that particular cooperative's um, you know, costs and, and whatnot, third party, and uh, the, the co-op can get a pretty good idea of what their return would be on a, on a peak demand um, you know, likelihood. Um, in that time period, just for the raw numbers, we did 258 assessments, and an assessment includes a full-blown floor door and duct blaster, pressure pans if needed. Um, we'll, we'll do the infrared camera. Uh, it takes about two hours. Um, we had 235 cost-effective offers. If an offer is determined by our firm not to be cost effective, then we won't offer it to the member. And in those cases, typically what I mean by that is we've got what I call kind of gold star, already energy efficient uh, folks participating. Um, and so we just give them a high five and move right along, but it's just not cost effective for them to, to you know, make their home more energy efficient than it already is. We try to weed those out on the phone before we even schedule assessments, but sometimes some, some slip through. Anyway, of those 235 cost-effective offers, 224 went to retrofits, which is a 90% conversion rate from assessment to retrofit. Unheard of. Unheard of. And again, during the Q&A section, we can discuss some of the, I'm happy, happy, more than happy to share some of our strategies as how we find those cost-effective, the most cost-effective measures in the home. Um, so for this particular co-op, 224 retrofits meant 3.7% of their entire service market territory, or penetration rate, 3.7% penetration in their, in their cooperative. Um, also, we were able to provide support through HVAC and or weatherization um, to a local workforce development of 20 plus jobs. So all in all, a really great story, and and uh, we experience this as a program operator ourselves. And this is one of the things I've been asked to come, and, and I have been speaking on the success of this all across the country, and why I'm here today. So without a shadow of a doubt, in our experience, um, Terracon Bill wins. Um, Include some financing programs, like I say are for everyone, by the way, not just low income customers. And I wanna mention how that works. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna run you guys through a, a fun little scenario during the Q&A section. I'm sure this will come up, so I'm gonna save it for that. But, uh, but it, it can definitely serve middle and high income people just as well. Uh, tariff on bill programs uh, qualify the energy efficiency upgrades at the site based on the cost effectiveness of the upgrades, not the credit worthiness or documented status of the of the customer or the member and so we think that's a very very fair way to do it um, utilities do not like to be typically in the in the business of patrolling who's rich enough to qualify um, or poor enough to qualify for assistance nobody wants to do that this removes that whole issue um, and pays based programs let the utility invest its cost of capital um, in these efficiency upgrades wherever they are found. Uh, no subsidies, no ratepayer funds, everyone pays their own way, 
and everyone saves money when they do it. The co-op, the participant, uh, really, and this is the only political thing I'll say today, it just doesn't matter what side of the aisle you are on, um, energy efficiency this way uh, seems to appeal to pretty much everybody. It's not really a polarizing conversation. Um, and because of that, it is scalable, it is sustainable, and it is all inclusive. And so everything that e utility does going forward uh, with any new uh, relationship we have is based on the tariff model. We will no longer, as a company, do the loan model. We are grandfathering in those that we currently have it, but we are working with them very diligently to try to switch them over to the tariff model. So with that, I'll say, I'll say a, a thank you, and then I'm going to jump in and show you guys. I do have still about 10 minutes left, mm -hmm. I think. I'm going to um, do something I don't normally do, but because we've got the benefit of general managers on the phone, I do want to share um, with you folks what your member would experience if they were participating in a, a tariff-based program that, that you would provide them. I want to show you what a report looks like from a member's perspective uh, so that you can, you know, kind of sit in their shoes for a minute. So everyone in the room and everyone on the, on the call, everyone on the planet essentially that has electricity has an electricity bill. So um, let's all pretend like the house that, that you see on the front page here is your home. Um, just picture your home in the place of the home here, which happens to be a mobile home. And, um, and try to find a way, if you will, why on earth you would say no to this offer. Try to, and, and, and feel free when, we, when we're at the Q&A section to pick this report apart and, um, and, and bring questions to me, as many as you like. So this particular, um, this, this particular mobile home is in the North Carolina territory. And um, as you can see on the right, it was built in 2006. It's a 2,040 square foot, one story mobile home with a crawl space. Um, on the left um, shows the member's basic information. And of course it shows the date of the assessment, which in this case was July 6th of 2017. You can see here that, that the mem this member's home um, has a $3,507 annual usage history. And this is the average of the last two years. Um, if you look to the right, it says your home's air leakage. So of course, like I said, we do a, a blower door test. So the ventilation rate for this home was 3,591 cubic feet per minute, which is the equivalent of a 1.36 seven square foot hole in their home. When you added up all the cracks, we added up all the cracks and crevices. Um, so the minimum ventilation rate for this member's home is 1591. So just simple, it's a little over two times as leaky as it should be ideally. Uh, moving over to the left again, the attic insulation. Now this is a mobile home. So, so you know, they're notoriously, you can't necessarily add insulation to a mobile home, which is one of the reasons that they're so hard to make energy efficient. But anyway, the R value of this home's uh, insulation is, came out at 16. And we will let them know that it is great to have R38 um, in their particular climate zone. You'll see in a minute what our recommendations are. But remember, what we're showing the member right now is their current state. When you look at the right, it says that your home's, um, your home's lighting, they currently have 28 incandescent light bulbs, zero CFLs, and zero LEDs. And even down to the fact that of the incandescent light bulbs, zero of them are not standard base bulbs. Yes, we count every bulb in the house. And by the way, we don't count bulbs that are never used. Like, you know, somebody's, I don't know, water heater closet. You know, how can you go in there and turn on your light? We're not counting those bulbs. Um, in the duct system, uh, we, we tested the duct system and found 30% leakage. It's a rigid duct system and we have 75 access to the duct system. Now we've used pressure pans in this duct system um, as well as the duct blaster test so we know where the leaks are. 
And you're going to see that here in a second when I go over what the recommendation improvement is. Over on the right, you see your home's heating and cooling. This particular mobile home has a three ton, seven sear strip heat split whole house system. So uh, when I'm sitting across from our member, I'll tell them because of the strip heat, um, if they don't understand what that is, they're essentially heating their home with hair dryers. And that's a big reason why their cost is so high. Um, <clears throat> we will go ahead, now this is an all electric home, so it's really not, you know, not that big of a deal in this particular sample, but just, I, I don't know how many, I assume there are some dual fuel uh, homes out here, whether it's gas or propane, but wherever there is uh, gas or propane, we will do a CAS test and make that report available to the member. Um, in this particular member's homes, it's all electric, so that's not really a, a big deal, but the member has mentioned some, some comfort issues. So the comfort issues show up right there. The member is saying that they have, obviously they're complaining about high bill, bill bills. They're stating that the system's not big enough. They're stating they have a comfort issue. They're stating that their HVAC unit, they feel is not repairable. Um, and of course, we're stating that all health and safety tests passed. Uh, over in their, on the right there, it says appliances are at home. They have a refrigerator that is a top freezer. Um, they have one only, it's in the kitchen. It's 21 cubic feet and it costs them $69 a year. Um, we can and occasionally will do other appliances, but we always do the refrigerator because everyone always has one. Um, if, and I don't know how it is here, but in the South, Usually there's three or four because there's an awful lot of hunting. There's an awful lot of putting up the peas in the garage sort of thing going on. And so it's not uncommon for us to see three or four, five hundred dollars a year refrigeration costs. <clears throat> now we're going to move on to the next page, which is essentially we're showing the member what are the savings and what are the one time costs. And by the way, we're showing the participant this on site at the conclusion of the assessment. Because we have the local contractors who are participating, we have their uh, costs in our software. And we are able to just literally pull up and put together the offer right there on site. And we found this was really important because a lot, you know, all of us work and it's costly to take time off work to be home, uh, even if it's just one day, it can really, you know, negatively impact a lot of people. And so we, we have done our best over the course of time to make our, our uh, visits with the member be as least intrusive as possible. So we have, as a firm, we have invested an awful lot of our resources into software that's enabled us to do this on site. So, so that said, um, here we have produced, again, on site, the offer to the, the member that the co-op is making. Well, here it is. So we have electric savings. If we reduce the ventilation rate by 25% leakage or better of $88.36. And I'll explain the or better here in a minute, which shows us we have a 6.6 year payback because the cost of that is included in this, this cost right down here. Um, sealing the duct system down to 15% leakage or better. We are confident we can do that because we found out where that 30% leakage was happening. We will install 28 LED light bulbs. Obviously that's a very quick payback. And we want to upgrade the HVAC with a 16 sear three ton eight point six HSPF all electric system. Astonishingly with a 4.8 year payback. You can see over here the one time costs for this work. The weatherization, it's typically air seal, duct seal, insulation and lighting. We put essentially under the, the title of weatherization. We'll also do low flow shower heads, uh, nest programmable thermostats, um, you know, any sort of demand response, eco beads or whatever. 
you'll put those all under weatherization and then we'll put the age back on its own. Um, but anyway, so together the cost for that is $7,006.74 and the annual estimated energy savings is $1,482.91. If the member can see here who the, uh, the HVAC contractor um, is. Uh, by the way, the member can choose right there on site which participating HVAC contractor they would like to use. The HVAC is required to have a uh, parts warranty for the duration of the, of the term of the tariff. Um, and the member is required, and it's in the quote, to have their units serviced once a year as part of their buy-in. And that makes the actual uh, warranty on the HVAC unit stay ba basically valid. So for those learners um, who are more visual and, and like graphs, we have a graph here that, that we use to, uh, to try to meet the member where they are that's showing essentially what I just what I just showed on current and future estimated use. And you can see it's pretty, pretty stark. And you can see the bar chart down below shows the actual dollars and cents we expect. You might have some green-minded folks that we are working with and they might really have a big passion for the environment. In that case, we've got a little section dedicated to those folks that says, here's the KWH reduction on an annual basis. CO2, pounds of coal, and vehicle miles offset. Um, if, 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 those, you know, if, if the member is interested in that sort of thing, we've got that information for them. And here's the meat. Here is what it looks like. Now, we have backed into this. Remember, we have backed into this term based on what the house has told us. So the improvement cost is $7,006.74. Um, we do have co-ops that offer health and safety initiatives, or in other words, a rebate for health and safety related concerns that would otherwise prevent the member from being able to go forward, um, up to $500. Um, we found that co-ops like to be able to do that, and by so something like that, I'm talking about, you know, a hole in the water heater closet or something that, that can be fixed fairly cheaply, or a section of the roof that needs, you know, some tar added to it. Um, a, a repair that if it's not done, we can't go forward with the cost effective work, but it needs to be done. Um, but that's not a requirement that a co-op do that, but it's a nice thing that, that so far our co-ops are, are very happy to do. Um, if there were a co-pay, and I can get back to this here again, um, you know, when we do the Q&A section, but just a quick let's say, and this is usually for a, a higher income earner where a co-pay comes in. We've got a home that's in better shape. We've got a member who is not as heavily burdened by their energy uh, use. Maybe they have a six or seven or maybe 10 year old HVAC system. They've got okay insulation. Their house is somewhat leaky. You know, it's not a, not a ton of energy savings to be had, but yet there's some. Well, it could be that there is a copay then in that case in order to make that 80 20 threshold. So in cases like that, we will have a copay there where the participant can choose, oh, okay, well, I still do want to get this higher, more efficient unit. I still do want to have my attic insulation low, like in Montana would be R44. I still do want to have X, Y, and Z, and I'm willing to pay a $1,500 copay to make sure that 80-20 rule applies for me. Um, so that's really where a copay, very seldom do we see a copay um, happen with a low income property. There's just plenty of savings usually to pay for that. Um, but occasionally we do, and that's usually um, a big low-income home that needs like two units where we might see something like that. Um, <clears throat> you can see here the, the total interest rate. Now this particular, see this is Roanoke, so they're borrowing at two and a quarter percent, and they're charging three percent to the member. I'll mention since there are general managers on, on the call that if uh, you're an RUS borrower, um, there's essentially limitless dollars you can get through ECLIP or EECLP. 
um, loans through through the RUS folks. There's also an RESP uh, loan product that just came out about a year ago that has, as of a month ago, been approved to be used for the tariff. Um, and it's at 0% interest for 10 years. Um, and that's because RUS has not done a real good job peddling the ECLIP e dollars, the ECLP uh, pot of money. And so they're kind of really enticing folks to jump on board by this 0% interest offering. I won't say it's easy to deal with the paperwork, it's, you know, it's government, so it's kind of a pain. However, 0% interest, I think they can be a little bit of a pain. Um, and I'm happy to tell you so far that all the co-ops that have uh, applied for the, uh, the, the uh, RESP 0% dollars, including Washita Electric, uh, have been awarded it. In fact, Washita Electric, the one I've been talking about from the prior PowerPoint, was just awarded $8 million to use in the, in the Help Pays program at 0% interest. So it's quite an attractive role model, or excuse me, capital model. Um, regardless, in this case, 3% uh, interest, the total interest paid by this member over, if you skip down a few lines, is 83 months, is $750.20, which means the total amount, including interest, is $77.56.94. Again, we back into the term of the loan based on that 820 rule, so this member's term is 83 months. So the cost added to the member's bill per month in its line item, and it says your tariff charge is $93.46, and the estimated savings per month is $123.58, which means the estimated savings in the member's pocket in this scenario is right at $30, which is almost a 25%. Uh, they're almost keeping 25% of the savings. If you look on the right, estimated annual return on investment, this one always gets me because it's actually, initially it's the, it's the co-op's investment in the member's energy efficiency. So remember, pretend like this is your home. This is somebody investing this for you. That's a 17.4% return on an investment that's made on your behalf. Pretty cool. Anybody say no to that? I mean, you'd be crazy, right? Um, an average 401k for comparison's sake across the country is at 6.1% return on investment, even a treasury bond is at 2.7. So if someone's more return on investment minded, just like if they're more environmentally minded or whatnot, that's what that section is for, to show you what that return is. And then the estimated energy savings analysis, this is the only place um, on, the, on the easy plan report that we do uh, take a look at the prior uh, 10 years of energy increase in, in terms of cost percentages. And we say, okay, the, the same amount of, the same percentage of, of costs are gonna go up probably in the next 10 years. And so we have added the assumed uh, increase in price to that. Now we have not added it to the left, anything on the left. So we're being very conservative with our projections because we're not, including the increase, in, I mean, usually energy doesn't come down in cost. Here again, we've got a bar chart that shows the member, uh, what their last 24 months was, what it will be or should be during the cost recovery period, and then what it should be once the cost recovery to the co-op is complete. There's essentially a disclaimer there that we, none of us can uh, you know, forecast weather and we can't forecast behavior. And so there's a disclaimer there that says we can't do that. And so we're doing our best with this cost effective analysis. But if someone's not getting the savings that they're supposed to be getting, it is utilities obligation and requirement to investigate why that is. It's determined that it is a contractor related issue, but again, remember these are 100% quality controlled and inspected before it's approved. But if it's determined that there's been a failure on an upgrade and it's contractor related, the contractor will have to replace it or utility will replace or fix it. If utility does, it won't be in the program anymore. Um, but uh, if it's, which is usually the case, if it's member related, we are able to give them a little bit more education on the behavior, what's, you know, why, why is that? they're not getting the savings they should. This doesn't happen very often. 
Um, but I can tell you like an example of, of um, got a couple times where it was contractor issue or related, just two. Um, but we've had about 15 times where it's member related and everything from putting in a, literally my sister um, sold her, 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 her tanning salon went bankrupt. So I put her tanning bed in my house. Well, that draws a lot of energy. <laughs> You know, literally things like that, where we've been able to educate the member and say, "Well, this is why you're, you know, this just wasn't like the kid. You know, we factor that in." Or literally, there's an RV now. My 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 kin is living on my property and hooked up their RV and things like that that were not present when we first did it. Um, if a member is involved in levelized billing or prepay, we will be able to walk them through that. I'm not going to get too involved in that. And then one of my favorite parts is this part right here and tends to be a member's favorite part too. So this is the scope of work. Um, we require and it, it happens in our software that, that everything that comes out is speaking in plain simple English that everybody can understand. And then it's itemized because we might have some DIY folks out there that want to do it themselves. And, and uh, we don't want to discourage that. I mean, that's a great thing. So here's how that works. We actually um, state what's going to happen in that home. And this same document talk, talks to the QC inspection or QC inspectors. We are getting in trouble here. Sorry, everybody. Um, talks to the QC inspector's test out sheet so the inspector knows exactly what they're looking for before they sign off on the house and being finished. So air sealing, we're going to caulk the living room door trim, caulk the master room door trim, seal plumbing under three sinks, caulk, caulk 35 linear feet around crown molding, seal around fireplace, and then lower door direct air seal through the home. So that's pretty descriptive. And remember when I mentioned I'll come back to the 25% or better air leakage reduction. What that means is that the contractor has agreed that, and by doing these things, they will get that um, or better. If they get 50% leakage, great. The member doesn't pay a penny more for that. But they will do these things. Um, what we're saying is on the assessment, we know that these things will reduce the ventilation rate by at least 25%. Why? Because we've actually done it during the assessment, we actually use blue payer state to take these things off and we find out what the CFM reduction is. And we determine the most cost effective bank for the buck right then and there when we're doing the assessment. So it's not a blind guess, it's a very detailed. So the member knows where the, leaky, the leakiest spots are in their own home, again, to support those that want to be DIY. Uh, duct ceiling wise, Duct sealing wise, um, again, we've done a duct blaster and pressure pan. So we found that we're going to seal 14 register boots to the floor. We're going to seal all the registers from the inside with Mastic on the system. And we're going to replace sleeves on four of the, of, of the on four, four registers. So we have found what we are comfortable enough to deal with at least 50% of the leakage. Why should we uncover something we can't get to and expose the member to a lot more cost than we need to? Right, and again, during the assessment, that's why it's so defined. We're using the blower door and duct blaster tools in a different way than they're typically used. We're not going to um, recommend attic insulation. It's not available. It's not available in this case. Um, we covered the rest there. And then the member is seen as again signing right here that. By signing down there, they are saying they do want to have these things installed and they understand what they are and they understand that if there's a need for a change order, they have to be notified and they have to agree in writing that it's okay. Very seldom does that happen, but it does sometimes. And this is just the plain language. This is the last page of the document and it just essentially reiterates what hopefully the member already knows because they signed up for the program, but it just reiterates, uh, you know, really how the program works um, and uh, you know, in simple plain language. 
So with that, I will uh, conclude and take a big breath and some water and thank everybody for uh, listening to all that and look forward to uh, taking your questions when it's time. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions, um, feel free to start um, sending them to us in the chat function. That's how we're gonna take questions and answer um, and, and do the Q&A section at the end of this. Um, so please, if you've got questions for Tammy, start um, putting them in the chat before uh, you forget. But our second presenter, we're now going to turn it over to David Bach with Flathead Electric here in Montana to uh, share about the Flathead Electric program, uh, tell us both how it's similar and different from what Tammy shared and a little bit of the Montana perspective. So uh, we will take just a second here to switch over to David as our presenter. Great, David, we can see your screen and I think you're still on mute. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Let me make this bigger. There we go, that should work better. All right, so um, yeah, my name is David Bope with Flathead Electric Cooperative over on the uh, west side of the state, obviously. And uh, I am our residential energy and technology specialist, one of our energy service members. And I've been running our residential energy programs now for about seven years. And when I started with Flathead Electric, we were offering rebates for upgrades, heat pumps, insulation, windows. And we had good success. We were getting activity, um, but we were hearing from our members over and over that um, one of the biggest problems was the, the money up front. Coming up with the upfront money to afford, especially for a heat pump, um, it was just a large investment that was difficult for most of our members to come up with. And so we thought, well, can we offer a loan option, some sort of way to help them finance this? And at the time, I did go out and look, and I came across the tariff option. But at that moment, um, I don't know if I potentially just didn't learn enough about it or um, it was still in infancy, but I don't remember finding a whole lot of examples of a historical activity in it. And so um, I did find uh, more of a traditional loan type program. And found a number of examples and we uh, took several variety to our board and the presentation here is going to be about the one that we decided to adopt and we've been running now for uh, about five and a half years and so we really are trying to just bridge the gap um, between the cost of the upfront cost of the project and um, the efficiency that the member is trying to gain so moving down that road we decided to set it up as a traditional loan um, where we have a rebate opportunity for them and the cost of the project minus the rebate would be the loan amount. This would be, of course, dependent on qualifying. There are qualifying pieces to this because it is a loan tied to the member, not tied to the meter itself. The minimum we would loan was $500 and the maximum that we would loan was $7,500. We set it up as 3% interest because that was what our borrowing interest is on in general. And we thought, well, if we can run the program so it does not um, and adversely affect other members by making us loan, borrow more than it is just a member by member program, um, being a, you know not impactive on the other members. And we'll set it up, up to a five year term, we decided. Um, we weren't sure at that point about default rates. Everything that we had from historical programs was pretty low on defaults, but we also were wanting to be careful about putting ourselves out there with a lot of very long term debt. And then we also set it up with a 1% administration fee. That was what they were required to pay upfront to help set it up. So that was only cost, maximum of $50. Basically, it covers our credit checks and a little bit of time to set up the loan. Um, we would um, loan on houses that were owner-occupied or rentals if the owner has an active account with us. So what that means is that if we have a absentee landlord, we couldn't help out on those accounts because we wouldn't have anywhere to put the loan because the loan was not going for the renter, the loan's going for the owner. We, the one place we cannot provide a loan or we decided not to provide a loan was on places that are on leased land. Um, so mobile home parks on leased land or 
um, even state lease land, we decided that, especially because of the mobile home park, that you know the uh, investment could potentially pick up and leave, that we were not going to touch those at that point, and we haven't added them yet. We haven't gotten a lot of questions on them through our program, but we haven't, haven't gone down that road. So the items that we will provide loans for are insulation windows, heat pumps, and heat pump water heaters. So they all qualify for a rebate from Flathead Electric. So someone who wants to upgrade one of those items and does not qualify for a rebate for some exclusion, unfortunately, I can't provide a loan either. So it really is tied strictly to our rebate program to help people move into our rebate program and through it. We set it up as a line item on their electric bill. We use NISC as our billing. And there's a loan module in there that is very easy to set up the loans and it automatically ties to the account and pulls every month and just adds it to their bill. So once we have all the loan paperwork in place to be able to set that up and when we've made the payment to the contractor for the work, it's really quite easy to put on the bill and it follows it through very simply also along the way. We do have a list of approved installers and we do require that work is performed by an approved installer, can't be done just by a homeowner. And then we do some random sampling for pre-authorization. So we do some progress inspections, some final inspections. We don't do every job. It depends on what they're doing as to what we'll cover um, for inspections. Um, but we do look, look at some of the jobs just to verify as we do with our rebate program. So it's basically just part of the rebate program there. Now, I did forget to mention that the uh, whole theme of this is actually a theme that we were running for our rebate programs back at the time that we set up the loan, and I don't have them a newer version of this. So at the time, our um, our theme was uh, we're going to put the fix out on energy um, use. And so we were helping our members fix their homes. We had a gangster theme, a 1930s gangster theme with it. So that's where that's where this, this comes along. So the theme actually has a whole advertising campaign that went with it, which I believe we won some awards for. But um, anyways, that is the theme of, of how this, uh, this uh, presentation is. So not that you have to read these pieces, but basically how the plan works is a homeowner would get an application packet from us and uh, fill it out and the solicited bids from qualified vendors. We would recommend they get multiple bids, but we don't require it. They have to sub select one and uh, submit that to us with their application. We would then evaluate the project to make sure that it qualifies. We would then also evaluate the homeowner's credit. And in order to evaluate their credit, we look at their payment history with us to start with. In NISC, um, if they are late on payments, they start to accrue points. Once they have more than nine points, we will not loan them a, we will not provide a loan for them. So they can be late a couple times in a year if they get disconnected, probably not going to be eligible. Um, so basically, you don't have to have perfect payment history, but you have to be, you have to have good payment history with us. And then we also look at the credit scores, 600 or above. So that covers. Um, last I checked, about 75% of the population have scores that are 600 or above. So we are figured we are catching people who generally pay their bills well, and the majority of the population will be eligible to apply for this type of loan. Um, if everything qualifies, I would then set up the actual loan paperwork for the member to sign, which includes a promissory note. Um, we don't put a lien on the house, so it is just a promissory note. In there is some pretty strict language about how if they don't pay their bill, and this is part of their bill in the future, that we will go down our normal disconnect path, and if they get disconnected, we will ask them to pay the whole loan amount back before they can get reconnected. So there is some pretty strict language about um, how this could cost quite a bit um, for them to get reconnected if they were to go down and, and the disconnect path and not pay us for it. So um, we warn everybody about that one up front. It is one consideration I want to make sure everybody's quite clear on. Um, so far, it hasn't been a problem. Um, we've only had one member actually ever go down that path, and we were able to work it out with them um, where we were able to keep their loan in place because they didn't go through a full disconnect. Um, once they've signed that paperwork, I will send an authorization letter to the contractor. It lets them know that uh, we are authorizing the money and that we're on the hook. They finish the work, they send us the paperwork, and we then send out a check to the contractor. We put it on the next month's bill. And it just rolls forward from then for up to five years as it was set up. There's no prepayment penalties. Members often prepay on things. Um, some of them do, some don't. But um, either way, it just rolls through in the normal payment situation. doesn't matter if they're on budget billing or if they're on regular billing. The one thing I can't do it with is we have a flex pay, which is a prepay. 
Um, and the loan does not play well with that because it would, the whole loan amount would come due on the very first day of the billing cycle. And if they don't have enough money, it would automatically shut them down. And then they need a bunch of money to start back on at the loan. So we decided not to get into that. So those are the those are our members that are not able to do this if they're on flex pay. They have to get back to a regular pay setup. This is the credit um, score, credit, credit matrix that I created, basically, that gives us approval or not approval. And I created a whole Excel spreadsheet that actually does all this automatically. So I put in the information on how many points they have on their account, what their credit scores are, what the cost of the job is, and it tells us whether they're approved or not. Um, most people generally get approved for up to $5,000 without a problem. Sometimes above that, in which case we will look at it, we will do a title search to make sure they don't have a bunch of liens on their house or other outstanding debt that we're not aware of. Um, sometimes we'll ask for a co-applicant, someone else on flat electric lines that could co-sign for them. Um, not as common a situation, but there are a couple of variations in there depending on where their credit scores come in and their points are with us. So even if their credit scores come in really poorly, we can still offer $1,000 even if they have a good payment history. So assuming that they pay their bills regularly on time, I can offer them 1000 irrelevant credit scores, and then we can go about that. This is our cheat sheet that helps members understand how much they might be paying per month on their bill depending on how much they borrow. Um, so it's just a, a quick upfront, you know, if you're looking to borrow this, this is what your payment might be. Get some prepared for what they might have to pay out. Um, people who borrow full 7,500 will end up paying about 135 a month on their bill. Now, compared to the tariff, um, this is going to equate to a larger overall bill for the whole year, um, even after the energy savings, than they, than they would have had without doing the project. So, as a result, they're setting themselves up in a situation where they have to pay more every year. Um, they're spreading it out every month, of course, instead of paying it all up front, but it's gonna cost them more on a year on their bill with this program until the loan is paid off. And then they'll be in the clear and accruing energy savings. Um, but as a result, they do have to be able to float the potential for some higher payments for the time they're on the loan. Very brief example of the cost of putting in a ductless heat pump in our territory and the rebate we might provide, the tax credits in the state. Um, basically, if you go through and look at the very bottom line, the out-of-pocket cost is, in this situation, the member would have to pay $35 to set up the fee um, for the loan, to set up the loan, versus $2,500 if they did it through a contractor without a loan from us. Um, of course, the overall cost in the end is three hundred and eight dollars and forty three cents difference. That's the interest and the administration fee, so it's costing them that much more overall for that loan. Um, basically, it reduces the rebate amount that they would be getting. This is our application for the loan. It's pretty basic. We want to know who they are, where they are, social security numbers so we can check credit scores, what they want to install, how many years they want to have that loan for and if they want us to cover the whole cost or if they want to pay something themselves. Basically, we want to make it as flexible as we can. We want to know if it's their primary residence, secondary residence, rental, you know, so we have some idea of what to be aware of as we're setting up that loan. And we want to know if it's on land they own or land that's re leased or rented, you know, that eligibility concern. That's the one eligibility concern. And then signatures at the bottom, and then list the information that they should be sending in with this, you know, an approved installer bid, um, if they're applying for a heat pump or windows reinstallation, there's also a pre-approval form for that. Um, so a couple other pieces of paperwork. All of these are available online on our website, so they can actually fill them out digitally and submit them if they'd like, or they can fill them out physically and send them in. We, uh, we went down this path because we were looking to do something very simple. Um, and our board and management decided that it was simplest if we did not run this out of house anywhere. So we are literally funding this in-house. We set up a revolving loan fund, um, which was very simple to implement. I run the loan program, so I do the credit checks and set up the loan paperwork. Our billing puts it on the bill, and um, our accounts payable pays it out. It's, it's pretty simple. We, over the time we've been running it, we've been adding to it each year. We pay out about 250000 each year in loans. And we now are at a total of about $670,000 in that fund that we've added to each year. And at this point, it is self-sustaining. So our, we're not having to put more in on their budgets, but as money gets paid back by the members, it's able to go back out again as a loan. Um, so it's become just a self-sustaining fund to create you know, incentives for the next year to help people out. And it's increased our dialogue. It's helped us get more work than we would have done before. 
Um, we get more satisfaction and community involvement, of course. Some of our contractors really love it. Some take big advantage of it. Others don't as much. But uh, either way, it's hopefully, hopefully helping with economic stimulus um, and being positive for a community. Total to date, eh, roughly, we've loaned out just under $1.5 million. Yeah, just under 400 loans. We're a little bit higher than some of these numbers because this is a couple months old now. Um, and we've been paid back about um, not quite a third of it uh, with zero defaults. So we're doing pretty well on it. Zero defaults to date. Um, we don't have any reason so far to change it. We've saved you know, potentially around 25,000 megawatt hours over the life of these installed measures for our members, which also gets us, of course, demand savings um, and decreased costs for us. We haven't actually monetized that at this point. Um, we're aware it's out there, but we hadn't put any money numbers to it because there hadn't been an incentive for us to monetize that. Um, but that is the benefit that's out there. At this point in time, we are still running this program. It's been very successful. Um, our members like it. It's not reaching everyone the way we would necessarily like to. It does not reach um, rentals all the time because owners are hesitant to sometimes do this. It doesn't reach people in mobile home parks that are on lease land. Um, it doesn't reach people with poor credit scores. So yes, we do have a lot of limitations to who it reaches. In general, when we survey the people who participate, about 70% say it was critical to be able to do the work. So we are reaching people that would not otherwise be able to do the work. We're just not reaching as many people as maybe we might like to. Um, as a result, we are going to be considering this next year the pay system um, with the tariff to see if that might be an option that we would like to pursue. Um, I don't know if that would be in replacement or in conjunction, but to see if that might be a way that we could use um, another alternative to be able to reach more of our members. To date, this one has been very simple with some very simple upfront funding from the co-op, um, which we were able to, fund, to afford. Um, we were able to roll this out in-house quite easily with relatively low overhead, not much impact um, to operating budgets and um, provide big incentives for our members. So um, it has been a great success from that perspective. It just hasn't been a success in reaching as many people as may maybe we would have liked to. So thank you so much for listening and I'd be happy to answer questions or um, obviously Five Day Electric Co-op, you're welcome to reach out. I would share anything that I have on the program if you would like to see um, how we're doing things or the actual spreadsheet we're using, um, be happy to share. So thanks for listening and I'll turn this back over now to you, Alicia. Great, thank you so much, David. Uh, that was a really great presentation and um, great to learn from, from what you guys have been able to achieve here in the state and uh, where you see yourself heading in the future. So we're excited now to open up Q&A. Um, if you're joining us by phone, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and uh, speak your question out if that's um, the best way that um, you can participate. Um, we also have the chat function going if you're on the webinar and would like to share a question. Um, we can direct them both to Tammy and to David. Um, so just to kick us off, um, one question is to Tammy, uh, as the your program has exploded in its growth, um, have you had to, to um, whether yourself or others in the communities, focus on any time on the workforce development side um, so that these energy efficiency professionals are ready to conduct all the assessments and retrofits that you're talking about? I appreciate that question. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you know, my business partner and I worked in Arkansas um, before we started utility for the Public Foundation, and we had done an awful lot of work in workforce development in Arkansas. Um, so when we stepped out and started utility and started doing this, a lot of that was done. Uh, that said, that did not happen in North Carolina. So when we went to North Carolina, um, we, we uh, for a, a brief period, uh, tried working with existing uh, assessors and contractors, of which there's very few um, in the area that had the expertise we needed. And as a matter of fact, that's a very timely question because our firm is actually literally uh, like a couple days ago, uh, just formed a company in North Carolina and sent out 
um, job announcements to hire locals to train and pay them very well uh, to do the work that we need them to do and put them on our payroll. So we, if there is a market and there is the workforce already in existence, we will happily support that workforce. If the workforce does not currently exist, we will happily support workforce development and that we'll actually hire them ourselves. Um, starting starting as $15 an hour with health benefits, just so you know. Now that's of course in North Carolina, um, but you know, we would look at whatever the market you know needs to have, but it's a it's considered we're, we will provide a living wage, not minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Other questions from our participants on the webinar or other questions from folks here in the room? Who else is on the phone? We have the general managers of um, five or six co-ops across Montana. Um, Do we know which ones? Uh, yes, I believe both Chung River um, and Macomb and uh, Missoula Electric, um, obviously Flathead Electric, um, and also Beartooth and Fall River okay. that I'm aware of. And if there are others, we welcome you. Um, one other question, um, I, I think, as you indicated, Tammy, one major source of funds for a number of co-ops is the Rural Utility Service. We heard from Flathead that they've been able to fund it in-house. Are those the only two that you've seen? Are there any others? Um, have you experienced any co-ops having hesitation taking on rural utility service debt? Well, so there are some co-ops, of course, that um, are not RUS borrowers, and if you're not an RUS borrower, chances are you're with CoBank or you're with CFC. Between those three I just mentioned, they make up 90% of the borrowing capital for co-ops across the country. Um, so I'm happy to say that we have a relationship with CoBank and CFC, um, given all the co-ops that we operate programs for, and they have very favorable terms. Um, not quite as favorable as zero percent, but nonetheless, uh, still fairly fav favorable in the event that, that some folks on the call are, are not our U.S. Borrow borrowers and therefore would not be able to get the ECLIP or RESP funds through our U.S. Great. Thank you. Sure. Well, I, I don't know if I really have a question. Um, I'm a little disappointed that my co-op, Park Electric, wasn't able to participate today, but um, at our annual meeting, membership meeting, just a week or so ago, when we questioned, or I questioned, um, energy efficiency upgrades and possible, I put it as you add to our services. And I hate this to sound like a commercial. I'm not trying to make it sound like a commercial, but it's important to mention that um, we actually are offering a loss reserve internally to our company um, to mitigate that perception of default because we're so convinced that, uh, I mean, that's putting our money where our mouth, with, mouth is. So, so we're, we are offering a loss reserve for co-op boards that have a concern about that that will make them whole. Great, thanks. Great, and I uh, see that one of our participants has maybe indicated that uh, he's interested in speaking. Uh, Kevin, do you have a question? I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I don't know where it's coming from, but uh, there must be a mic on my uh, computer somehow. Is that um, I made the transition from a BPA customer where I ran conservation programs and certainly appreciate all the resources that David has at Flathead to run those. And I know the focus of your conversation is the financing, but um, running a, a small electric cooperative in rural Montana is certainly different than uh, being a BPA customer with all the resources uh, that are available through them as far as standards and certification of contractors and specifying high efficiency equipment and so forth. But I think the biggest hurdle for us, and uh, I think probably Tongue River and other co-ops are probably faced with the same thing, is that having 
certified installers and uh, installation guidelines for ventilation and heat pump efficiency and other things like that. It's really on the installer certification and verification side that uh, I would look for the most help because I don't have an energy efficiency person on staff and I'm sure most of the other ones don't. Um, the, the financing is the least of my problem. I think that's easy to put together and manage the risk associated with that. We've got our US uh, access as well, but I think the biggest help we could get is some third party organization that would provide uh, people that would do energy audits, they would do verification, they would set certification parameters to make sure that uh, the installers we had were licensed bonded and had the proper training on ventilation and installation techniques and so forth because uh, that just isn't a resource or a, a network of trade allies that I can necessarily reach out to and I'm sure it's something that all the co-ops face in the smaller communities. Thank you, Kevin. That's a great point, great question. I'm gonna turn it over to Tammy to respond. Well, high fives for that question uh, and comment, Kevin. I appreciate that. That is exactly why we started our, our firm. Um, uh, again, not to try to sound like a commercial, but there are certainly co-ops who prefer and can and, and would choose uh, to provide the services that you illustrated in-house and, and organize and, and program, operate, et cetera. Um, there are certainly some out there, but what we found is, is that there were an awful lot that, like you, did not have, not just the, the resources or a bit of you know, human resources in the local areas to, to turn to, but the time uh, to even figure out how to do that, because you all wear so many hats. So we literally created our B Corporation to serve that function. And um, so, you know, our goal is to scale nationally and is not to stay in Arkansas. Um, we are entertaining offers right now from South Carolina and Tennessee, Missouri, Louisiana, primarily in the Southeast. I, I don't mind saying that I have a personal vested interest in Montana because I will be retiring here. <laughs> I mean, I'm a one-time resident of Montana um, in the in the in the Bitterroot Valley, and so uh, I do plan to retire up actually near David, up at, up near the Flathead. So I'm actively seeking property there, as a matter of fact, to do just that. But but no, uh, besides my self-interest, we're we're regionally where our exposure so far is limited to the southeast, and it's very important for us as a company with with goals of national scale to get into different climate zones than just the Southeast. And so I welcome an opportunity uh, to provide these services that you're, you're talking about to any co-op in Montana that is interested. And, and as far as you know, the conversations, um, the, the, the concerns that you've had with your board and you know, understandably all those are valid and, and you know, you, you wouldn't know necessarily that such a service is available, but I'm happy to tell you it is, and we'd be happy to provide it. Well, that's, I think that's a big piece of the puzzle is having people that we could rely on and just pay, pay a fee for the verification and other things like that. Rather, rather than having a full-time body until the volume increases where we could justify the position. But right now, if we just paid a fee for inspection, verification, and, and audits, um, and have certified contractors uh, that know how to install windows and floor and ceiling insulation and all that other stuff, uh, we just don't want it. A lot of it is just managing liability. Sure. We don't want to be buying houses. Of course you don't. Well, that's another reason that a lot of co-ops like the idea of essentially a third party handling that we're sort of the firewall. Our, our, our client, if you will, make no mistake about it, is the utility that we work for. And of course, your client is your member. Uh, right. but, but whether we, again, whether we directly hire the contractors and the assessors ourselves and put them on their payroll in such a case where the workforce development has yet to occur, 
and there aren't already existing um, you know, companies doing this in your service area, or whether we come in and provide work with your help to those firms that are existing, therefore, you know, increasing monies in the local economies, either one, we're, we're prepared to do either one. I should mention that it might come to a surprise to, to you guys, but I'm actually very, very proud of this, that utility is the only uh, program operator in the country that has base, well, we're the first, the only B Corp in the country that does this, and uh, we're the only um, company in the country that has literally lined up our fee structure to mirror that of our contractors and assessors, and that means that we are paid for performance as well. As a matter of fact, um, the, the cost for our program operations has been included in that in that um, um, easy plan that you saw. Uh, the, the members portion of our costs has been included in that, and I'm not afraid to tell you that the the uh, co-ops portion of our services, in a scenario like I just showed you, uh, that's not recoverable on the bill, is $600, and that includes the assessment. Right. It includes includes the M and B on the back end includes all program operations. Uh, so it doesn't matter what market we go into, that's our fee for service. Um, so that's what it costs to get soup to nuts, everything that we offer uh, for the co-op. And then the members portion, it depends on what, it depends on what the member chooses. If HVAC's included, then the members portion is 300. If HVAC's not included, then the members portion is 200. And that we only collect if the member goes forward. Well, that's why I called in today is to hear this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, we, we, again, we're paid for performance. We don't come in and charge a big old giant administrative fee and, and we are hands, hands on, sleeves rolled up. Um, everything's transparent and everything's quantified with full M and V. So it, it's not pretend savings using Dean savings estimates, it's actual savings. I have a question for you, Kevin, and any other general manager on the phone. Do you all have smart meters? We don't call those smart meters. That is a absolute death trap. Oh, the word? Absolutely. Don't even mention that on the news in case on this on this broadcast in case somebody picks up on it. Okay. Oops. Okay. I didn't say that. What do you call, what do you call uh, your meters? We are in the process of a digital meter upgrade. Digital meter upgrade. All right. The internet is full of just heresy about how evil smart meters are, regardless of the technology that uh, I, I know. Uh, I know too many utilities that have fallen prey to this evil stuff that's out on the internet that just tells you you're going to grow a third eye and how unhealthy it is. <laughs> I know it's been branded as smart meters, but you'll never hear that from Beartooth. All right. You got it. So your <laughs> digital meter technology, um, are you in the middle of doing that? I'm just start? in the front. I'm working today, actually working on an RFP to send out for the meters themselves. Oh, okay. Well, it's not imperative that you have this already. Uh, it's encouraging to know that you will have it, but I just just want to clarify here that it's not the only tool we have in our tool chest to do really good M and B, but it is a really great tool that we like to use um, when we have pre and post digital meter technology information. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I. The same system I'm deploying here, I deployed in 2004 back in Oregon. Um, it's just, I, I don't know how you could exist without that technology right now because it makes so much business sense before you get in, cross the uh, line into the energy information uh, benefits that you get out of them. I don't want to get too far off topic, but Kevin or any other general managers on the phone, are any of you guys, uh, uh, bringing uh, fiber to your members or, or talking about that right now? No, I wish we could. I, 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 mean, 
Uh, because a lot of our folks are starting to look that way too, and it it, it seems to make it seems to be a topic of conversation. I would be right now, technology wise, with broadband. I would be better, very reticent to invest in anything that had wires going to the home, whether it's fiber or copper. I think, right. I think, I just think that the future is with WiMAX or uh, uh, very broadband, uh, far reaching uh, broadband technology that's all wireless. Yeah. Well, um, okay, it looks like uh, we have one final question from Mark, um, Mark Hayden, via the chat. I see, uh, Mark, let me see if I can unmute you um, for your question. Or if you want to enter it into the chat. Okay, well, um, I will go ahead and, and say we'll, we'll wrap this up for now. Thank you so much for your time. We're at our hour and a half mark that we uh, committed to. Thank you to both of our presenters, uh, Tammy Agard and David Bo, for being here with us. Um, we hope that this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Um, I hope that if you have more questions, please get in contact with my colleague, Kristen, um, who emailed you about this webinar opportunity. We have recorded this webinar. We'll be sending out the recording to you as well as Tammy's information. And again, uh, do please feel free to get in touch with us with any additional questions. And thank you for your participation today. With that, uh, have a great rest of your Friday.